So we will begin um, with our introductions, and we'll begin with our guests. Um, and I'll begin with Dr. Uh, Donish Haleski. He is a Macedonian, um, and he um, received his undergraduate degree in Macedonia, and then his master's degree in Germany, in Bonn, and his PhD in Budapest at the Central European uh, University. Donny is also a huge Orlando Magic fan, and spent his senior year of high school on exchange in Florida. He got to see some basketball games, he may or may not have a few different Magic basketball jerseys in his closet. <laughs> yeah, next up, um, we also have Margaret Klasnia joining us today, who's from Serbia originally. Um, he did his undergrad in Serbia as well in economics, um, but had an American girlfriend, and so um, made his way across to the U.S., um, where he did his master's at American University in Washington, D.C. He then worked for a think tank, um, the Peterson Institute for International Economics, for two years before going um, back to school, actually, to do his PhD at NYU, uh, followed by a postdoc at Princeton, so pretty impressive resume, and um, now he's at Georgetown University, and we're very glad to have him today. We also have um, one of our very own, who is um, Kieran Auerbach. She's doing a PhD um, at UNC here in political science, um, focusing on political parties and corruption in Bosnia. Um, she actually started her um, academic career with an undergrad at Stanford in international relations, then did her master's in Sarajevo and Bologna, um, and worked in Sarajevo for a while. She was also a professional violinist, which uh, she said in a video you know, in a different life than what she did. Um, so yeah, thank you for joining us today. And finally, someone all of us here probably already know, Dr. Milada Bashdova, who um, received her bachelor's at Stanford University. And Stanford not being enough, she was a Marshall Scholar at Oxford, where she received her doctorate. Um, Milada is also an award-winning author. Um, and a great international scholar focusing on European security and the Balkans. And I believe I can say this for her, please go folks. Um, without further ado. All right, you guys, thank you so much for coming. So the title of this event is, I think, Corruption and the Erosion of Democracy in Southeastern Europe. And what we thought we would do is all four of us kind of reflect no more than 10 minutes, on <laughs> kind of our conception of uh, the state of corruption and the fight against corruption in democratizing countries, especially in Southeastern Europe, with the caveat that there's plenty of corruption in what we consider to be advanced, industrialized, or Western countries, but we all have to have research interests in um, post-communist states, and reflect, I think, both on the question of are we surprised, sort of 25 years after the fall of the Berlin Wall, and Wall, with many countries joining the EU, some of them working to join the EU, that corruption is still such a problem? Uh, are we surprised that in some countries there's been backsliding in terms of quality of uh, democracy? Although here I have to say Hungary really takes the cake. It's quite the overachiever, which is, <laughs> you could argue kind of set the tone for the whole region, but there are worrying trends in and then reflect on, and, and Kieran and Bonnie are going to talk about Bosnia and Macedonia respectively, which are countries where they have done a lot of field research and life research, both of you. Um, so these are countries that are especially struggling when it comes to the quality of democracy. And I think I'll end by reflecting kind of on some positive trends on the really optimists. So do we see a way out of this uh, in the near to Thanks. Uh, thank you, Milana, for, um, for the center to the invitation for all of you being here. I'll give you a short uh, background, very short, on Macedonia, and then get into more of a contemporary situation and problems. So I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with this country. It used to be part of Yugoslavia. Yugoslavia was all part uh, in the 90s. Macedonia declared independence in 91, and it, it has been a contested independence ever since. Most, mainly, maybe some of you have heard that the country has a is engulfed in a so-called name dispute with Greece that objects the 
name of the country, obviously, a couple of months, I won't go uh, into that, but I'll, I'll tell you later why I mentioned and why it's, it's important. Another important feature to know of the country is that it's an uh, ethnically diverse uh, society, so there is a majority of Slav-speaking uh, Christian Orthodox, uh, referred to as ethnic Macedonians, and there is a non-majority community of Sunni Muslim Albanian-speaking ethnic Albanians. Um, this has been also been very relevant because, you know, one of the puzzling things about Macedonia is why didn't the country fail? I mean, it was a place that it was more likely to have an ethnic war when Yugoslavia disintegrated than uh, Bosnia because of the divergence. I mean, the people in Bosnia were really, you know, similar in terms of the language that they spoke. You had a lot of inter uh, marriages uh, between Croats, Serbs, and Bosnia. In Macedonia, no, these two communities, the Albanian and ethnic Macedonia, are really segregated. They still live, you know, apart. But until 2001, it had a very peaceful transition. So it had a peaceful secession from uh, Yugoslavia, the Declaration of Independence, and then there was an inter-ethnic conflict in 2001. A little bit because of the Albanian uh, community in Macedonia was not happy how things were developing and the extent of minority rights that they were uh, getting. and. Um, that they had, and there was also a spillover effect from the crisis in Kosovo in 99, a lot of guns and armed groups uh, going around. So this was a really uh, a pivotal moment for the country where it got out of this conflict in 2001, and it really had a nice uh, reconsolidation of democracy in the sub uh, sequence several years. So in 2005, uh, there was a peace agreement that was signed. It actually didn't evolve. It was a protracted ethnic conflict, not to the scale of Bosnia or Croatia. Very few casualties. And it was the conflict ended by the signing of a so-called Oflit Framework Agreement, which did institutional changes, uh, mainly providing for more, more minority rights. But the, the government that came to power in 2002 was very committed to implementing the Oakley Framework Agreement instigating uh, and uh, starting uh, reforms and also moving the country forward towards the EU, uh, towards the EU, EU accession. The Macedonia actually got a status of uh, EU candidate um, country in 2005 and it looked, you know, an, again as a success case. So in the early 90s it was called an oasis of peace because everybody else in the in the Balkans were fighting and you had a small territory there that was you know, very likely to have a civil war, but it didn't. So it was a oasis of peace and, and from 2006 onwards, it was one of the cases, uh, one of the countries that was really seen as at the forefront of democratic and EU reforms. But then, you know, as Milada said, now is the country in power with Bosnia and Kosovo it has most of the problems. So what happened? In 2006, the right-oriented uh, government came to power and with a very technocratic neoliberal agenda, but they looked very, very legit that, you know, they really want to get the economy going. And for a couple of years, they did a lot of good policy reforms. IMF, World Bank, European Union, everybody applauded. And the EU integration process went in parallel with integration in NATO. And in 2008, the country was set to get into NATO. There was a summit in Bucharest. But then, you know, to remind you of the name dispute, it wasn't dissolved, it wasn't uh, solved. And Greece is a NATO member country and had the possibility and the options to object to because the entry into NATO has to be unanimous. That's so Greece objected. Uh, the country didn't get, Macedonia didn't enter into NATO. And then you have this young, uh, and I think you know it's, it's important to stress that the government currently in Macedonia is very young. The prime minister, the average age of the minister, I think, is somewhere between 30 and 40, or maybe 36, 37. Um, you know, they had a, a choice to make, you know, what to do to solve the name dispute, which has a lot of political uh, and emotional uh, costs, or, you know, to do uh, a 180. And they opted for the 180. Instead of pursuing more democracy and new integration, they really turned into nationalism and authoritarian practices. Uh, I won't, you know, go to a large detail into that now, but, you know, in terms of nationalism, maybe you have seen a recent uh, 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 pictures or images of the revamping of the capital city of Skopje and the inner center. So I see another nods. This is Skopje 2014 project, which is reinventing the history and the identity of the people in, in Macedonia and bringing it, believe it or not, more in line with ancient Macedonia, with Alexander the Great, you know, 3,000 years ago. But 
this is you know ridiculous in this context. In that context, is it is a sign of objection towards against the uh, against Greece. So you know, it's a, I, I, if you want, we can go into the, the um, details of the name disputes. But you know, for personally, for me, it's too metaphysical. <laughs> I really want to you know leave it leave it aside. But it has very important big policy uh, consequences. So one is the revamping. The second, as I said, you know, not being able to get into NATO, and the ruling uh, government decides, you know, to go uh, to really capture the state. And this is very important when we come to the issue of corruption. Previously, Macedonia, you know, had corruption, struggled with corruption, uh, starting off with Yugoslavia. There was corruption, there was nepotism. You had to have a, uh, you know, uh, you have to be approved by the Communist Party to get a public employment, but it wasn't a widespread corruption in terms of gross abuse of public funds. You know, it wasn't up there and you know then through the 90s it got worse so we had uh, again you know kind of even a culture of impunity and a lot of high level corruption but then you know things as the country moved forward to the European Union you have to clear up the act so there was some improvements but from 2000 and onwards the level the extent of how of, of, the, of the regression how bad now things were just you know perplexing I didn't know if you followed in 2015 there was a um, uh, a wiretapping scandal. So uh, the cronism uh, currently in the state captured, uh, Macedonia is a, is a state now captured by a small family. So you have the prime minister uh, in charge, his name uh, is Mr. Nikola Gwerski, and he appointed his cousin to be the head of the secret police. And he appointed his god, uh, 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 a best man, to be the minister of finance. So you know, this is a small family clique, and they are running the country. And this guy, the, the head of the, the Secret Service, I mean, really, you know, a shady, shady uh, character, and they organized a Stasi-like operation. They wiretapped 20,000 uh, phones in Macedonia, 20,000 people. And this is a small country. It's a country of, 20, of 2 million people, right? Um, and 20,000 people is basically everyone that's anyone in the country in terms of the political, even me, yeah. and I was also like that, because in that period I was in, uh, kind of <coughs> involved in the politics with the other guys. Uh, by, I was like that uh, intentionally and by default, because, you know, you're by, they're right between you, I'm calling you, so, you know. Uh, but this is un, unbelievable, the amount, so everyone uh, who is uh, the political elite, economic elite, uh, members of diplomatic corps, journalists, everyone. Uh, and, you know, to just give you another uh, benchmark, how big the magnitude of this, the previous secret service, including during communism in Yugoslavia, have never had such a wiretapping operation in Macedonia. <laughs> so, you know, and this happened in a uh, period of six years. And now it got out what they were doing. All the, first of all, it's a big gross uh, abuse of human rights, right? Human rights breach. But then it got out, and because they were not wiretapping the others, they were also wiretapping themselves. They were wiretapping, yes, yeah, seriously, the Minister of Finance, the Minister of Transport, and, you know, the amounts, the information that's now surfaces out there in the public that they have done so much political criminality that, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's amazing. From appointing judges to um, uh, public employment to setting uh, public tenders to... Uh, the, the Prime Minister buying, you know, a very expensive car because, you know, he can afford it. Uh, and another thing, that going, uh, again, the Skopje 2000 revamping project, you know, everybody laughs at it uh, on aesthetic grounds, right? It's kitschy, it's unbelievable that somebody would do it in the 21st century, but it's not, it's not a laughing matter. It's actually a daylight robbery. The whole project, uh, the conservative assessment at, at this moment is that is above 600, uh, 600 million euros. Uh, so this is uh, uh, more than 700 million dollars, US dollars, right? And this is a very poor country. Uh, the unemployment is around 30%. Uh, people living on two, uh, $2 per day is more than that. You have people who, uh, who earn minimum income and they're still uh, below the poverty day. So it's unbelievable. This is daylight robbery. And they used all the money not only to pocket and to enrich themselves, but also to restructure the private sector, 
which is a real, you know, uh, a, a concern and a very big problem in, in future, right? So you have them now not only controlling the public sector and, you know, abusing power to the public institution, but also to a large extent of the private sector. So what can be done about it? You know, is, this, is there any hope in, in this situation? There are a couple, and I'm finishing here. One is that on the uh, insistence of the international community and agreed by the political parties, um, because when the wiretapping broke, uh, broke out in 2015, we had a whole year of protest and you know an attempt for a for a revolution. It was a bit of a tense period. The international community, the EU, principally mediated. The new commissioner uh, for uh, enlargement, Ham. Uh, from Austria, and uh, they agreed that uh, a special public uh, prosecutor, an office of a special public prosecutor, will be set up to investigate the wiretappings and the crimin uh, all the political criminality that come with it. So there is an attempt to restore rule of law. Uh, she is trying her best to investigate and to bring uh, matters to, uh, to, to light. But there are a lot of uh, impediments by the court system because, mind you, you know, all the public institutions are controlled, are captured by this clique and the ruling party. Uh, just to give you a very strong illustration, there was a court order for the prosecutor to go to the uh, secret police <coughs> and investigate things, you know, to go to see the computers and get access to the data. And the secret police said, no, you know, you can't do that. I mean, can you imagine a police officer not, I mean, not implementing, but define a court order. So this is the extent of the, of the problems, and this is what this uh, special public prosecutor uh, grapples with, but, you know, she has a lot of support, international and domestic, and she, she has uh, shown a lot of courage and strength, and I think she will uh, persevere. So that is the legal uh, way out, and it has to be, uh, it has, it will be a difficult one, but it has to be, it has to be done. All the breaches have to be investigated. Everybody has to be, you know, brought into, uh, all the matters have to be brought into court of law. There is also a political way out, which is also important to restore and to revive democracy. Very soon in December there will be elections, and there is a convergence of civil society activists that were very active in this protest and the political opposition. Hopefully they will amass more uh, electoral support than the, than the ruling coalition, and then we will have uh, an opportunity to, as I said, restore democracy, but also what is very important, I think in Macedonia, but in other countries that share the similar problems, to um, reset the parallel of why people go into politics. You know, and it's not uh, about, I mean, okay, it's public service, but it's more important service uh, that you are serving the public. And you're into politics, you know, to contribute to the public good, which currently, you know, we have a lot of, uh, uh, it's not irresponsible with a lot of rationality that the same politics as a shortcut to amassing, uh, amassing personal wealth. And you, know, uh, uh, and you know, we really, really need to, need to change that. And as I said, the only, uh, there are two ways to do it. Uh, there is a formal legal way to do it, but also the political way to show you know, that uh, people are not, uh, are not satisfied and they want, to, they want to help people accountable, both uh, legally and also electorally. Thank you so much. I think uh, everything hinges on the left, so, right? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Sounds like my <laughs> is in order. So, Kieran. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, I am going to talk about democratization in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, so, my research focuses on um, the role of political parties in corruption. So, you know, I'll talk um, in line with that. So. With Bosnia, we have 20 plus years of democratization, I mean, or the lack of, um, that we can learn from, you know, the, the experience of Bosnia. And it's interesting because Bosnia had the heaviest international involvement in uh, promoting democracy, yet it is um, definitely the most dysfunctional state out of all of the Western Balkans. Um, so how did we get there? Um, I'm gonna, you know, give an overview and then end with the, the latest um, political debacle in the country. Um, so uh, in 1995, the U.S. spearheaded um, efforts 
to end the war in Bosnia. So it brought the warring factions from Bosnia. This included the leaders of um, political parties um, that were that led the country into war. It included um, Croatia, Serbia, and Russia, Western European countries. And what it did was establish not only a peace agreement, but also the constitution of Bosnia. Um, and although you know this was a very undemocratic process because uh, Bosnians had no say um, in their own constitution, it was written in English before it was ever translated into the local language, um, but it was seen as necessary to stop the violence and, and set the country on a, a more you know positive path. And and the most important thing about the constitution, it established this very complicated um, political institutional structure, um, which defined, it, it is a very complex ethnic power sharing agreement. So all the positions in government and the whole administrative structure um, is defined by ethnicity. Um, for example, there's not one president in Bosnia, there are three presidents. Um, one Serb, one Croat, and one Bosniak Muslim. You know, this obviously makes things harder to get accomplished um, when you have this redundancy. And then it also established two highly autonomous regions in the country called entities. And these entities have more power than the actual central, central state of Bosnia. Um, and this was seen as necessary because um, to, to quiet ethnic tensions. So one entity is dominated by Serbs, it's um, over 80% Serb, and the other entity is um, mixed with Croats and Bosnians. So that was you know, the way the country was set up. And the next turning point was um, the first national elections, which were held not even a year after Dayton was signed. Um, and this was seen as a very big mistake by all the international experts that were working in the country. Um, so they were saying that Bosnia is not ready for elections. You know, new parties haven't had time to build um, any you know organization. But um, it was pushed by the U.S. So elections, you know, have always been considered a good thing um, for democracy. But also, so Bill Clinton had um, another incentive. He was running for re-election in the U.S. and wanted to show that there had been some success in Bosnia. So he actually pushed these elections. And the result was that um, the, the ethnic parties, the ones that led Bosnia into war, dominated these elections and consolidated their power. And then this sort of set in stone um, ethnicity as the biggest political cleavage in the country. Um, and then um, adding to this, um, you know, I mentioned the international community has a very heavy involvement in Bosnia. They had set up what was called the Office of the High Representative. This is an international actor that has more power than any politician in Bosnia. It's referred to as the High Representative. Um, it has, you know, the, the, the individual has rotated over time, and what they what happened in the early years, so you know, in, from 96, you know, for the next 10 years, um, the high representative was very active in removing leaders and politicians um, that were, you know, uh, wanted for war crimes, for example, had very serious allegations of corruption, or were doing things that violated the Constitution. So this included judges, um, political party members, um, and other um, politicians. And so this kind of kept the lid on the fundamental problems of the country. Um, and as many um, you know, uh, politicians were removed from the main um, Serb party of Radovan Karadzic, this kind of opened uh, space for new parties to evolve. And it was hoped that these new parties would be more moderate. That didn't really happen. Um, and so after the, the early 2000s, the influence of the high representative went down. And 
the influence of the international community went down as well. Um, so there was the, the, the line um, from the EU and the US was that Bosnia had to become more sustainable on its own and you know the citizens of Bosnia had to take control of their own country. The US and EU didn't really want to continue this heavy-handed um, involvement. And, and, and as a result of that, these very fundamental problems of these ethnic parties that were colluding behind the scenes, that, as Dada mentioned, were really trying to maximize their personal wealth and subvert mechanisms of democratic accountability. You know, when the international community started losing interest, corruption, I would say, even increased. Um, and so, for example, we see lots of political parties, they put um, party members on the steering boards of public companies and they're colluding, they're getting rich from all of this kind of activity. Um, and this brings us to the latest debacle in the country, um, from, which happened in September. And um, to give you, you know, from my personal experience, when I was doing field work this, this past year, I came back in August, and the ruling party in the Serb entity, the SNSD, led by Milorad Dodik, um, it, it's the ruling party, but it has been um, plagued by corruption scandals. People are really unhappy with their performance um, in the RS, and so it, it's been losing popularity. Um, and everyone kind of expected this party to really go down in the local elections that were held in October. Um, and keep in mind, I'd like to also mention, this was a party that was backed by the U.S. in the early days um, as an alternative to the very nationalistic SDS party led by uh, Karadzic. And so the U.S. actually gave money to this party. It was a self-proclaimed social democratic party. They said all the right things um, to Clinton and to Madeleine Albright. You know, they, you know, and what happened when they actually got into power, they became even more nationalistic um, than Karadzic uh, party because this was a way to get votes. Rather than actually you know, um, doing things for the people, by using these same ethnic fears, they gained popularity. And the same you know, technique is what we, what we just saw. So um, you know, I was wondering how SNSD would hold on to power. Um, what it would do, and um, it didn't disappoint us. <laughs> so basically what it did was um, hold a referendum in the Serb entity. And this referendum concerned whether you know, people thought that a national holiday to mark the founding of the Republika Srpska, the Serb entity, which would be held on January 9th. And so many of you may be aware, January 9th is um, Serbian Orthodox Christmas holiday. Um, and so as a result of this, the, the Bosnian Constitutional Court ruled this referendum to be illegal because it violated the rights of non-Serbs living in the Republic of Serbia. And barely 50% of the population turned out. However, they got close to 100% support for this referendum. And so this really mobilized people. Um, this was you know, an old technique from the 90s that's still being used today. And as a result, the local elections, which took place basically two weeks after, um, helped SNSD, which had been losing power, to reconsolidate its power. So it actually won these local elections. So this, this um, spectacle of the referendum really worked. Um, and so this is where we are now. And um, I think the, you know, the other thing we can talk about is that as the EU and um, the US lose interest in Bosnia, this paves the way for other powers to you know, really get involved. So for example, Russia backed the, the Serb referendum and is getting more involved um, in Bosnia. And we also see a lot of influence from Arab countries 
um, who are investing in Bosnia. And this, this has cultural you know, implications. Um, they're building mosques, not just businesses. And so this is kind of you know, a, a, a worrying trend um, that, you know, um, and Malata, I'm sure, will talk about this. Um, you know, what should the EU and, and the US do? Because I think that they're, you know, if they disappear, that will not be good for um, the prospects of democracy in the country. So I'll end here. Great. And I think it's really striking, right, when you listen to the Macedonia and the Bulgaria of Bosnia story, this use of sort of national symbolism, right? So the whole Skopje 2014 project, we can laugh at it, but if you go to Dasha and Skopje, I mean, the city is completely transformed. Millions and millions of dollars have been spent, some of it not even on the buildings, right? So it's a huge corruption machine. But it kind of redefines identity. I know it's too existential, but, and then here, another kind of case of just totally cynical, right? To have this referendum about something which was clearly just a cultural issue that, it's a non-issue meant to mobilize people, right? I think here in North Carolina, we had similar legislation in the spring. I mean, to mobilize a certain set of people around a certain kind of social issue and get them very nicely timed right before the election. It's not my turn yet. <laughs> <laughs> I have a whole thing. Um, so I'm just going to so what I think I'll do is sort of echo a lot of the, the things that um, uh, you know, Dominic already mentioned, uh, but sort of try and talk about it from not sort of talking a, about a particular country, um, but more kind of conceptually. And I, I'm afraid I'm going to sound very pessimistic, um, which in the end I am, I think. Um, but also hopefully, you know, sort of eliminate some of the things that, that I think hold generally, not just for the region. Um, so I guess the first point to make is that um, which I think is a pretty depressing point, is, you know, corruption, unfortunately, is one of these things where human creativity comes to, to the fore, like, you know, things like torture, uh, where it's incredible how much human variety and how much creativity uh, people show in, in sort of protecting corruption. So one sort of anecdote I'd like to, uh, to, to mention is, so I've, I've studied uh, Romania quite a bit, corruption in Romania, and, and so one of the, the quirky but kind of telling uh, stories is, um, so Romania has been uh, pretty active in prosecuting corrupt politicians. Uh, it's been active in prosecuting lower level politicians, more so than higher level politicians, but that's sort of not unusual. Um, uh, and this was partly, or mostly, uh, under the pressure of the European Union. Um, and, you know, the result of that is that a lot of the politicians ended up, ended up in jail. Uh, but no sooner than politicians started and ended up in jail had the politicians come up with ways to get out of jail pretty quickly. And they found a loophole in sort of an arcane law um, uh, that sort of you know, lays down some of the procedures of, of you know, how you actually you know, uh, sit up or sentence in jail. And found that this really odd provision that says that if you conduct scientific research in jail and write, uh, write up your scientific research and manage to publish it, you will get your sentence shortened. And you will get it shortened by a particular amount. So if you write one book, your, your sentence gets shortened by six weeks. And you can imagine that all of a sudden you have politicians writing in a copious amount of social scientific <laughs> books, shortening, you know, shortening their sentence, you know, six weeks uh, of the intern, right? And so, you know, there's a famous example of, uh, of, a, of a politician who doesn't even have, a, you know, a graduate degree, who has written nine uh, books and published all of them. And you can, you know, do the math, nine by, you know, nine times uh, six weeks is, is not a negligible uh, so, so I think one thing to sort of keep in mind that's sort of true to, uh, to you know, both the region and everywhere else is, is that politicians will endlessly find ways to, uh, uh, to both be corrupt and, and sort of get away with it. Um, and so, I don't, know, I don't know if that's sort of a pessimistic uh, statement, but, uh, but I believe that's a huge challenge for, for sort of any anti-corruption uh, uh, policy, right? And, you know, we had a comment yesterday when we were presenting papers, which I really liked, which was that we should probably think of as a default in we're thinking about sort of accountability for corruption, that politicians are absolutely not interested in accountability unless they're forced to, uh, to be accountable. Right? Um, and, and in places like Southeast Europe, where challenges are already pretty high, this is definitely sounds or even it looks like uh, like a default. Um, so that sort of leads me to my second point, which is that uh, you know 
if you sort of look at the data of anywhere in the world, processes like sort of improvements in governments and, uh, and anti-corruption are extremely slow. They're slow moving. Um, you know, one of the very strong correlations that comes out of the data is that you know if you correlate uh, democracy, say, with corruption, we typically think that democracy, you know, uh, should in principle at least help alleviate problems of corruption by you know, having politicians, you know, have to run for re-election and then you know be sort of voted out if uh, if they have not performed or been corrupt. Um, but if you you know correlate the data, what you find is that democracy itself is not correlated with corruption or with less corruption, uh, but the length of democracy seems to be. Now, whether that's causal or not, you know, it's a, it's, it's a tough uh, you know, question to, uh, uh, to, to resolve, but it seems like, you know, democracies that have been democracies for a long time do exhibit lower corruption. Uh, so perhaps there is sort of a, you know, hope uh, over a longer period of time, uh, but this, you know, if you look at the data, it seems like, you know, you have to have democracy for 40, 50, 60 years uh, to sort of bear the fruits. Uh, rather than you know the young democracies and, uh, that we're talking about, which are you know Serbia, uh, you know, and, and any of the you know, post-communist uh, countries in the region. Okay, uh, and sort of you know I can talk, a, yeah, I can give you a lot of sort of examples of how this sort of fight, uh, sort of this democratic fight against corruption, you know, kind of gets stymied over and over. So again, when I was doing research in uh, in Romania, uh, you know, Romania has a very activist anti-corruption body, which is called ANI, which is a sort of national uh, uh, directorate against uh, against corruption. Which is tasked, among other things, with uh, with collecting data on uh, politicians' wealth, uh, sort of with the assumption that you know, sort of publishing that information about wealth will allow citizens, civil society, etc., journalists, uh, to sort of track you know the wealth increase uh, over time. Um, and and this has been sort of you know one of these sort of textbooks you know textbooks sort of stories of struggle of sort of push and pull. Uh, so no so again no sooner than the, the this uh, this uh, agency has been established had the politicians tried to to basically defund it and so they couldn't do it you know sort of head on right because that was sort of blatant you know uh, sort of meddling with the mandate of the agency but they sort of tried to do it you know back door and so what they would do is they would basically you know the provision in the law was to you know have the agency have at least nine offices in a particular building in, in Bucharest. And you know, the politicians defund that, and you know there are nine offices that are sitting empty, and the, you know the the agency cannot move in because there's no money to you know buy printers or chairs or you know whatever computers, etc. And so on and so forth. And then you know one of the, the the biggest mandate of this agency is to publish wealth declarations that every politician who stands for office has to uh, has to fill out. Um, and then you know all you know as soon as uh, this uh, this mandatory requirement kicks in, politicians start suing uh, the agency, and you know. There's a sort of lengthy process of, of this case going all the way to the Supreme Court uh, in Romania, where uh, politicians say this is a violation of their human rights because they're supposed to uh, report, among other things, their real estate holdings, and so this is sort of a violation of privacy uh, because it would, you know, you know, in principle, you know, people would know where the politicians live and they can sort of go and sort of torch the place down and stuff like that. Of course, none of that happened, but but these are sort of the, some of these kind of backdoor ways to uh, uh, to do that. But sort of. Perhaps even more to the point is, um, you know, very often we sort of forget to think about these particular kinds of agencies as political actors as well. Um, and so, I, you know, part of my research in Romania was actually trying to systematically code these data on wealth, uh, wealth from the wealth corporations in order to actually track the wealth accumulation of politicians. And sort of, as an aside, not surprisingly, I found that uh, politicians accumulated an obscene amount of wealth uh, in the office. Um, uh, and and you know one of the, so the way that the system works is that um, politicians you know have to fill out these forms. They often do that in you know pen and you know pen and paper, uh, and then these get scanned and posted on a portal uh, that the agency maintains. And so everybody can go and you know find a declaration of a particular politician and you know look look for themselves. Of course, the issue is that if you were a journalist, you're an investigative journalist or a civil society. You know, uh, organization who wanted to sort of systematically collate this data and say, okay, here's all the politicians in Romania, and here's how much they accumulate over one term in office. You can't because these are, you know, these are scanned, handwritten documents, and good luck, you know, uh, trying to uh, to digitize them. Right? And so what turned out was that uh, this particular agency got a grant from the, the European Union to digitize them. So they bought these very, you know, high tech. 20 printers and digitized, you know, scanned them systematically for months on end, and then finally came up with a data set, database that's actually searchable and very, very user friendly. 
but they decided not to actually share it with the public. And I was very baffled with that. I was like, why? I mean, if you're, if the point, if the mandate of the agency is to increase transparency, why would the agency shoot you know, itself to, in, in, in the foot and, and not do it? And nobody really told me, you know, directly, but my understanding is that essentially, you know, the agency's rationale was, well, it has to pick its fights. It has to pick its political fights with uh, politicians in order to be able to, you know, maintain its existence, right? And this was sort of a fight, you know, one fight too many, right? Uh, in the sense that, you know, it realized that if it does that, uh, it's going to sort of give a lot of ammunition to the politicians to, to shut it down, right? And so this transparency is kind of part of a, of a, of a political process that, uh, that's hard to, sometimes hard to maintain. Right? Uh, and then finally, so that leads me to the third point, which is that there's only so much the sort of political economy of, of this of anti-corruption can achieve. Um, and sort of what Donna said was, uh, you have to have to sort of have this shift in paradigm, right? This sort of shift in norms as to, you know, why you run for office or what the political, you know, or who the political elite is beholden to, uh, right? And that's an incredibly, incredibly difficult process, right? Changing norms is, is something that's, that's very, very long-term Hard to do, and so you know a lot of you know Milada's work that's been very influential is sort of how the EU has been able to sort of brought about this change in norms, uh, especially in a set of countries that were sort of trying to exceed. All right, uh, but where I'm sort of pessimistic is I'm afraid that this this sort of you know transformative influence of the EU has been both uh, you know you know waning and uh, and it's going to sort of be less and less uh, less and less strong future for several reasons. So one is we've seen a lot of backsliding in, all, you know, in countries that are already members of the EU, uh, most notably uh, Hungary. And I guess this is in a way expected, right? So there was a big push, but now that they're in the EU, EU is very weak. It doesn't have you know, very effective you know, sanctioning mechanisms. Uh, I mean, you know, Hungary's been sort of poking the eye of the EU you know, uh, for a long time and sort of seeing how far it can, uh, it can poke uh, without EU sort of jumping back and saying, okay, that's enough, right? And unfortunately, we haven't seen that that's enough uh, quite yet. Now, how about the EU's influence among the countries that have not yet exceeded, like Macedonia, and Bosnia, and Serbia, uh, and so on? Where there, it seems like you know the EU is not as committed to uh, to the accession process as it was uh, for for the sort of initial you know, the bigger the bigger set of countries like the Czech Republic and Slovakia and Poland and so on and so forth. And also, there's been some uh, you know some uh, increasing skepticism and sort of um, uh, you know the, the publics in these countries are a bit tired. <coughs> sort of increasing the look like uh, the county promises for the EU. And then finally, the third one, which is sort of, you know, kind of ground is shifting below our feet as we talk about it, right? The EU itself is, is going through a crisis, you know, the Brexit and, and the, the, the refugee um, uh, issues, which is going to sort of make EU both directly and indirectly more um, um, uh, kind of, uh, you know, passive uh, in, this, in this sort of governance fight in the, uh, in the region. You know, on the one hand, is going to be direct in the sense that the EU is going to be preoccupied with issues that do not have necessarily to do with, with Southeast Europe uh, per se. And then indirectly, uh, I actually expect that in the EU, we're going to actually see, see an increase in, in, in corruption. And for example, one of the mechanisms by which that's going to, this, that, that may play out is that usually what happens is when, when sort of the, the cleavages by which politics is being, is being organized change, uh, governance kind of gets pushed to the side. So, we're probably going to see parties that are going to run and compete uh, on things like nationalism and anti, uh, anti refugee sentiments. And these parties are both going to drive the attention away from, from issues of, of, of governance, but they're also going to sort of, just like what both Dami and, uh, and Karana have mentioned, they're going to play up things like nationalism, uh, right? They're going to sort of distract from, uh, from corruption. And we usually see again in the data that you know, parties that espouse uh, another dimension uh, very energetically, like, uh, like like nationalism, ethnicity, uh, identity, or uh, or things like that, tend to also be more corrupt because they can get away with it, right? Because people are more so voting for these parties on the nation's side. So, sort of to, to wrap up, I'm not I'm not particularly uh, uh, optimistic about sort of, uh, mm -hmm. the, the, the current trends in uh, corruption. Well, I guess that leads it to me to be a little bit optimistic. Um, I'll just start by saying this this anti corruption thing in Romania called Ani would never exist if it wasn't for the EU. So whether its existence can move 
mountains or just little hills, but you know. So I guess I will start by, I think I'll focus really on the role of the EU. So many of you are in the midst of an EU integration class. And I think what is so interesting is kind of the evolution of the concept of EU conditionality or EU leverage. So how many of you have studied EU conditionality with Christian Lincoln or a little bit with me? So, a lot with me. <laughs> so, you know, in the mid-1990s when I first started doing my doctoral research, I was doing a lot of field research in places like Sofia and Bratislava and even Prague and Warsaw. And one of the things I noticed were the enormous deficiencies in terms of how the state treats the citizen and how the government regulates the economy. So a lot of different ways in which there was much, much, much more improvement. And the EU came in with its um, uh, requirements for membership, which were both general, like you need to be democracies with functioning market economies, the Copenhagen criteria, and very specific, this 100,000 pages of the Aki communitaire. So the Aki communitaire is really something to hang your hat on when you think about uh, EU enlargement, but also the fight against corruption, because the Aki communitaire is the rules and regulations in force among EU member states. And at this point in 95, and, and it continues, they're not necessarily put in place with the new members in mind, right? Like if the EU member states had seen the fall of communism coming and all these new members coming, they might have thought twice about having so little acquis in the areas of rule of law and democracy, uh, quality of democracy. So in the mid to late 90s, you had these new countries adopting this 100,000 pages of acquis communitaire being evaluated on their general health of their democracy. And they really had two, two things happen. On the Aki, you had a lot of domestic reforms which were very specific and mostly to do with functioning within the internal market. So here we're talking environmental regulations, health and safety, uh, state aids, uh, bank privatization, mostly to do with the internal market because that's mostly what the EU was in the business of doing up to that point. And then some in the political side of things, but more like putting out fires. So you need to have some minimum standard of minority rights. We're not going to look too closely until you know hundreds of Roma are suddenly seeking asylum from the Czech Republic in Britain with very well documented you know stories of, of persecution and violence against them by the police and local authorities. Or when suddenly you have Hungary making noises about border changes, so suddenly you deal with that. So it wasn't as consistent, but the reason it wasn't consistent is because there's no aki on minority rights. This is something that was being, that with the wars in Yugoslavia, EU leaders said, oh, well, we don't have anything about minority rights because the Greeks refuse and the French refuse, but for you new members, we're going to require something because we don't want <coughs> ethnic conflict in the EU. With corruption, it came later. It was 2007 to 2004 or 5 with Romania and Bulgaria coming in. That, um, that all of a sudden um, it became a real issue and that you realize that, that the enlargement process so far had not really sufficiently shored up the rule of law, that judiciary reform which had been sort of recommended by the EU, you know, there are many different forms of how to, to, to run your judiciary among existing EU member states. And so the message to the candidates was like, well, sort of choose one reasonable sort of way to organize your uh, judiciary. There was no specific blueprint, but they were pushing for a lot of independence for the judiciary, which in some cases just meant that the judiciary was completely independent to be completely corrupt, like Bratislava, like Slovakia. So, um, but again, just like in minority rights, I have a lot of students who and a lot of scholars look around Europe today and say, why hasn't the EU done more for minority rights? Well, it's the same as for corruption, because among existing EU member states, there have been no acquis on how to fight corruption. Now, there are parts of the acquis that can help you fight corruption indirectly, but they never sat down and wrote rules. Now, why didn't they do that? Well, the reasons are called Greece, Italy, 
also Portugal and France, so certain member states who were just completely against that. They did not want the EU to be fighting corruption in their countries for obvious reasons, uh, obvious to us. Um, <laughs> so then what happened? So now you have suddenly um, everyone thinks, well, if you're going to have a substantial improvement in the quality of democracy and if the fight of corruption is to be successful, it's going to have to come from the EU. Uh, but that's hard, right? I think I've explained why. Now, in Bulgaria and Romania, you did have a pretty strong push where the EU basically said, OK, fine. We don't have any rules for our members, but you guys are so bad that we're going to force you to have this cooperation verification mechanism. We're going to force you to make head rate on the rule of law and the fight against corruption. And until you do, we're not letting you into Schengen. The commission got very upset because they said that the two things have nothing to do with each other, sort of like when Mareka said that Macedonia name dispute and bailing out Greece, economy has nothing to do with each other. That's exactly what the commission said. They said, how can you do this? But it actually worked because at that point, France and Germany had some leverage over Romania and Bulgaria by saying, you're in the EU, but you're not getting into Schengen until you do this. So there's some hope there in the sense that you can find ways to still have leverage. Now for the Western Balkan states, what the um, EU has said is it's going to be much tougher. So for the new set of states coming in, it's supposedly a much tougher process when it comes to judiciary reform and the rule of law. Um, Marcos already mentioned you have a problem of kind of waning attention on the part of the EU. So yes, they have these tougher standards, but they're putting less kind of heart and soul into the process. And you know, some of that is because of the time period. Some of it is also because of where these countries are and how big they are, right? I mean, Germany had a big interest in having Poland come into the EU for a whole bunch of reasons, from security and um, kind of geopolitical reasons to economic reasons. For the Western Balkan states, these are very small countries with very small economies. And here, the interest isn't economic. It's solely a stability interest, right? Like, let's keep on moving into the EU so we will have a, a stable region. Um, so you have a problem with the attention span and the benefits. You also have a problem with um, the fact that as the EU kind of slowly continues with its succession process, the corrupt people are learning, right? So the EU is presumably learning and domestic actors and civil society groups should be learning about how to fight corruption, but these guys are obviously learning, and they're mostly guys. These shady characters are learning about how to kind of perfect their state capture mechanisms. So you have more and more collusion. One of the theories which Kieran works with in the dissertation that sort of debunks, which is sad, is that if you have stronger political competition, opposing parties will be kind of watchdogs on each other's competition. But sometimes you find them, sure, they fight it out on the talk shows, but behind the scenes they're actually colluding. And when that happens, it's very hard. Learning in terms of how costly it is to lose power. For, so in the past, corrupt governments have made the mistake of going too far to try to stay in power because they thought, oh, if we lose power, we'll go to jail, we'll be finished. Well, if there's one lesson of East European politics since 1989 is that the corrupt, nasty characters have never really finished. They might find a way to come back as as respectable statesmen, like Serbia's Prime Minister Rucic, sort of. Or they might find a way to come back as just as corrupt machine as ever, like um, the Bulgarian Socialist Party. Uh, but very few of them end up in jail. Very, very few of them. So they should all stop worrying about the anti-corruption, stop worrying about losing power, because as far as I can tell, they're in pretty good position. And then the other thing they've de been perfecting, which we've talked about is deflecting, right? Deflecting the voters from caring about corruption and the kind of quality of democracy by energizing them with these identity or national issues, whether it's Macedonia's glorious past, I don't know what you would call it, Hellenic? No. Ancient. 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 Um, or in Hungary with the refugee crisis, uh, these have been very powerful. Um, but 
I'm going to end with two kind of positive. Um, well, first I would say one more thing. You have these cases that we've talked about, Massimo and, and, and Bosnia, which where corruption is so endemic and so like, these institutions have been so corrupted by it. You know, institutions are sticky, whether they're good institutions or bad institutions. It's hard to find a way out. Uh, but in a way, I feel like in Macedonia, there's more reason to hope because you have this confrontation that's coming down, right, between the nationalist corrupt and the reformers. You know, sort of good against evil. That's sort of we can put our mind around. It's like 1989, you know, in Warsaw. Whereas the Czech Republic, where I'm from, for example, 20% minimum of all public funds are stolen. There's a couple oligarchs who completely control the press. Uh, the, Finance minister owns half of Czech agricultural production. He was declared one of the top five most powerful billionaires in the world by Forbes. This guy is a nasty piece of work who got all his money from the Russians. The problem, right, in the Czech Republic is that nobody's mobilized against it. It's a non-issue. It's there's no ideology, there's no Orban, there's no it's there's no nationalism. It's just endemic corruption and the country's rich enough and people are passive enough but it doesn't even seem to be an issue. So in some way, the Czech case worries me more than a case where you actually have protests and mobilization and, and a, a judicial procedure actually in place to at least try to investigate this. Um, so I'll end on a positive note, which I think two things. One is that the EU accession process has been beneficial for every single country that has been in it from the point of view of reforming the state Forming how the state treats the citizen, and putting some checks on how um, parties and politicians behave in some cases. To put it another way, the counterfactual is a lot worse. Right? What would Romania look like today outside the EU? It would look like Moldova, I guess, right? How much ethnic conflict would we have today you know, in some places, or how much more state capture? And also just mobility, right? In a lot of these countries now, young people vote with their feet and go live somewhere else. And on the one hand, that impoverishes their homeland, but on the other hand, the European Union does give a lot of um, uh, fulfillment to talented Europeans. Not British people anymore, apparently, but, but the rest. <laughs> um, and the other positive thing I say, I'll say is that I think over time, whether or not domestic actors are mobilized in support of higher quality democracy and, and kind of fundamental rights and freedoms and tolerance, I think these things wax and wane. So right now we can feel very depressed about the lack of protest in Hungary against what's become an authoritarian regime. We can be very depressed about the, the hateful way in which a lot of extreme right wing and right wing political parties speak about migrants in many countries. But I do feel like when we look at the history of European politics since World War II, we have had these moments where we feel like these are bad guys are kind of taking over. And it swings back. So there's, and I think in corruption, there's a certain amount of swinging back um, in some places. I'm not sure how convincing that last part was, but I tried. <laughs>